and joined yet. And uh, if you're staying in here in the adult class, there is a follow sheet that's on the back table. If you want to pick one of those up, you can follow along and take notes. And um, that's there for your, your use. We've been in this series, Enemies of the Soul. And last week, uh, we started talking about the world, the world. And so there are primarily three enemies that we have in our spiritual walk. The first is the flesh. We talked about that, dealt with that uh, the first two weeks of this series. Now we're talking about the world. Last week, we established what the world was, and we looked primarily at three words. The first word that you'll notice on your notes is the word cosmos. That's a Greek word. And the Greek word means the orderly arrangement of the world, including its inhabitants. And that's cosmos. And that's where we get uh, the, the idea of space and, and everything around us. The next word that we looked at was the, was the word eon, which is a Greek word meaning a space or period of time. So we have this phrase, right? I haven't seen you in eons. It's been eons means a long time. And so eon is a space of period or time, especially a lifetime, a lifetime. Um, and then the third word that we looked at was oikimune, and it's a Greek word for world meaning land, globe, or earth. So it's literally the dirt we stand on. It's the earth we inhabit. <clears throat> so our enemy is not the earth. It's not the planet. But when we say our enemy, talking about the world, we're talking about the eon or the age in which we live. We're talking about the cosmos. We're talking about the arrangement that's in the world. Um, so those are the words that are primarily used in the New Testament describing the world uh, and used for the world in the context of what we're talking about. So again, our enemies are the flesh, the world, and then finally Satan. So we'll be dealing with Satan later. But let's answer this question. What does the world compromise? What does the world compromise? Well, Regardless of the age in which we live, we're always going to encounter certain elements that make up the world. We're going to encounter the root causes of sin because they come from the following things according to 1 John 2.15. 1 John 2.15 says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God provide, abides forever. So notice the three things that are mentioned there. You have the lust of the flesh. You can write that down, the lust of the flesh. You have the lust of the eyes. And then the pride of life. Now, let's just all admit, we all have motivations, we have desires, we have ambitions, we have strong inclinations. There's an urge in every one of us to fit in with the environment around us and to participate in the activities that are common to whatever age we live in, whatever eon, that Greek word eon that we live in. And the Christian task is for us to be discerning. The Christian is tasked with discerning the satanic devices that are particular to our day. And so those sins, the things that bring those sins that are in the world that we mentioned, those three things for 1 John, they're always present with us, but their devices are devised differently during the time period in which we live. So for instance, lust has always been an issue, right? It's always been there. But how that lust manifests itself, Paul didn't have a computer in his pocket that was a temptation for him as a man to look at pornography. But lust was still there. So that's what I'm talking about when I say the devices that are deployed differently in our time and in our season in which we live. So our task is to discern. Everybody say the word discern. You have to discern 
what's going on in the world around you, and you have to shun some things. You have to remove some things from your life. 1 John 4 and 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out in the world. So we're to discern, discern. Again, say that word, discern. The next thing is that we have a pastor, and a pastor in each of our lives is meant to help us on how to discern. Ezekiel 44 and 23 says, They shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy, and to cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. So part of my role as a pastor is guiding you to discern what's going on in society and in the world, and look at that through a biblical lens, and there are certain things we should withdraw from, there are certain things we should remove from our life, and if we can't stand up to the temptation that surrounds us, then we should put it out. What did Jesus say about the eye? You'd be better off to remove your own eye, right? You lose some things in the pursuit of saving your soul. So we have to discern And then the Lord has given us leadership to equip us in that process of discerning. So there are some scriptural warnings. God does not warn us without cause. And that's an important thing. Anytime you look at scripture, you think you're reading something, you're wondering how does this apply to me today, sometimes it's just a warning. God's giving us a warning. If no danger existed, God's word would not impose any restriction on us. So the idea that we just we live in grace and that we're not supposed to worry about anything in the world, we just keep trotting along, doing our life as we want to do it in grace, that's a totally unbiblical idea. The Bible directs us toward Christian living. It directs us in how to conduct our lives. Or all those words were wasted. But Scripture tells us that all of the words there were given by inspiration. That means God breathed, inspiration of the Holy Ghost. So danger exists, and we have to impose some restrictions upon ourselves. And the dangers in the Word adequately warns us of them. Each scripture here speaks of dangers in the world. We're going to go through them one at a time. And some of the verses, they'll use the word, the Greek word that I mentioned before is eon, the meaning age. And some of them use the word cosmos, meaning orderly arrangement. But the first is this. The world has its pollutions. Write that down. Pollutions. 2 Peter 2 and 20 talks of these pollutions. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. So when you think about the word pollution, what do you think of? Air? You say it, garbage? Garbage is a pollutant, right? And we're concerned with pollutions in our, in our earth, polluting the atmosphere, polluting the streams, polluting the, the lakes I love to fish in, and the seas, and all that good stuff. We're concerned about those pollutions. Well, Scripture here is talking about pollutions that would pollute your soul, pollute your mind, pollute your life. And it all comes from the world. And it even says that if you get entangled in those pollutions you've been delivered from before, then the latter end is worse than the beginning. The next point is the world. The world has its corruption. Write that down. Everyone say corruption. Corruption. Second Peter 1 and 4 by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So you think about lust, what does lust do? Lust corrupts, right? Lust will corrupt the relationship that's supposed to be there between a man and a woman in marriage. Lust will corrupt many things. So we've escaped that corruption through Jesus Christ. We have these great, precious promises, partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption. But that corruption is not gone. It's still present in the world. 
That's why we must guard our eyes, guard our mind, guard our ears, guard our heart, because the corruption is still there. The world, point C, has its cares, its cares. Matthew 13, 22, now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word. The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. Luke 8, 14, now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. Have you ever found yourself overly concerned, overwhelmed with the cares of this life? I'll admit, I have. There have been seasons in my life where I, I get to looking around and I start thinking, you know, I'm, I've got kids, I've got a wife, I've got to take care of them, and I'm not as far along as I'd hoped I'd be in this life, and so on and so forth. And that, that pressure can be overwhelming and overcome me if I allow it. But I have to recognize life is just a little sliver of what eternity is. If we go through this life with nothing, and I don't have all the cares of this life fulfilled for me, and I make it into eternity, I'm pretty sure in eternity I will not care. I will be all, it'll be all forgotten. So don't let the cares of this life choke out what God wants to do in your life. The point D, the world has its God, God, and that's a little g, God. 2 Corinthians 4 and 4 says, Whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So there is a God of this age who is intentionally trying to blind, trying to blind. Point E, the world has its course, course. Ephesians 2 and 2, and this means like a path. It, it has its path that it walks, its course. And which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. There's a course in this world that the prince of power in this world, the little g god of this age, is wanting us to walk. But we can be free of that. We can overcome that. Point F, the world has its lusts. Titus 2 and 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, the eon. So, there are worldly lusts that are all around us. We must be aware. We must be discerning of those spirits that are at work. Point G, the world has its form, or another term that's used a lot in translations, is fashion. Fashion. 1 Corinthians 7.31, those who use this world is not misusing it, for the form of this world is passing away. Everything that you see here, it's passing away. It's not going to survive. It's not going to last. And the fashion of this world is it just keeps going, and it's going to go away. Point H, the world has its evil. Galatians 1 and 4, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Point I, the world has its wisdom. Everybody say wisdom. Wisdom. There's a wisdom that is appealing to the flesh. It's appealing in this world that is not heaven-born. And if we're not careful, we'll fall into listening to the wrong kind of wisdom. I can give you some examples of that. An example of that would be this. The world tells us that we should gather together and hoard up everything we can for the future because we don't know what the future holds. Amen? Anybody ever heard that? Put it away. Put that money away. Squirrel it away. Be stingy. Scripture tells us that if you give, it shall be given, pressed down together, shaken, running over. What does that mean? That's not a prosperity gospel preaching point. It is just simply this. Heaven 
says that whenever it's tight, you should be loose and let go of some things. You should give. And in giving, there's a blessing that comes back to you. Now, that's not always a big monetary blessing. Some blessings are hidden, and we don't recognize and see them for what they are. But God always is true to his word, and he will bless us. But worldly wisdom would say, no, you need to hang on to everything. You need to be get yours and take care of you. Scripture tells us that we should put others above ourselves. We should look one for another and care and love. So, there's a world that has its own wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1.20, where is the wise, where is the scribe, where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? 1 Corinthians 2 and 6, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Their wisdom will not last. It won't. 1 Corinthians 3.18, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he, he may become wise. James 3, 15 through 17, this wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. The world has its wisdom, but we, we're pursuing God, and God has his own heaven-born wisdom. The world has its spirit, 1 Corinthians 2 and 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. And so as a Christian, as a believer, as a Holy Ghost-filled person, we are called to be on guard, to discern, to recognize the world for what it is, to discern the spirits at work in this world, and realize that each one of these spirits, each one of these things that I mentioned in Scripture, they're continually trying to encroach into our lives. I recently read a statistic that said every day when you get up, we're going out, we're being hit in the ears, the eyes, right smack in the face with 12,000 different messages of marketing. We receive over 12,000 messages that are trying to suggest to us what we need or what we don't have, what we should have, what will make us happy, what will make us joyous, what will make us feel peaceful and wonderful. And it's all just lies. It's all empty. Because anybody, anybody who's ever bought something that you just, you had to have. You ever, I just, oh, I've, I've got to have, it's going to make my life so wonderful. I can remember the first iPhone came out, and I remember thinking, man, everything, I have a phone, my PDA and my phone can be one thing, and I have everything there, and a calendar in my pocket, and I was so impressed. I thought, man, this is going to make life so simple, so easy. Guess what? It has not. I'm on iPhone, I don't know, 13. And I've had 13 generations of letdown. My life has not improved because of iPhone. I'm using that as an example. And I think all of us can probably relate in some way. You had that thing you just had. And any, any joy or the freshness of it, the the pleasure you got from it, it was very temporary. Amen? It goes away. And so understand, there's, there's this spirit in the age that is continually trying to encroach into our lives, and we cannot allow it. We cannot allow it, because if we allow it, it its intention is to separate us from God, separate us from God. So let's talk about scriptural methods for handling the world. Scriptural methods for handling the world. 
knowing the enemy is one thing, but knowing how to conquer the enemy is quite another. And what I'm going to talk to you about or tell you here, it's going to come across as simplistic. It's going to sound elementary. You're going to think it can't be that simple. But the biblical method for handling the world and overcoming it is very simple. It's simple in the knowledge. It's not quite as simple in execution. How many of us will admit our trouble is never with the knowledge, it's with the execution? I struggle. I can put a plan together all day long about things I want to get done. And then when it comes to execute it, there are a lot of other things I'd rather do. So, let's talk about this. It's quite a challenge when we think of the task. But our Lord expects nothing less of us. And not only does he expect it, but he also empowers us. Everybody say the word empower. Look at somebody beside you and say, if you're filled with the Spirit, you have the power. You are empowered. You're empowered. So in the Greek, original Greek, the word overcome means to subdue, to conquer, prevail, or get victory. Old saints would ask me, hey, you got the victory? Have you got the victory? I'm working on getting victory in some things. But we can overcome. The dictionary defines it as to get the better of in competition, to master, to suppress, to prevail over, or overwhelm. So here are scriptural teachings about overcoming. The first is this. Jesus overcame the world. Jesus overcame the world. The one who has empowered you overcame the world. John 16, 33, these things, these things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He has overcome everything you're going to face and deal with in this world. He's already put it under his own control. He's overwhelmed it. He's, he is in control. And so if you're putting your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, you just cling to the rock. And trust me, you will make it. Don't let doubt get in the way. And whenever doubt comes, and it does come, amen, then you recognize it as doubt. I tell myself often, Lane, that's just doubt. Lane, that's just your fear. Lane, that is, that is not of God. You need to trust God. Trust the Lord. He's overcome all of this stuff that you're dealing with right now. The second point. Point B is this, we're to overcome evil with good, Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, with good. What is the thing that overcomes evil? It's good, it's good. Point C, there is a victory that overcomes the world, 1 John 5, 4 through 5, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. That's why we need a new birth experience. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith, who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Point D, we can overcome because of the power within us. 1 John 4, 1 through 4 Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world, but this you know the Spirit of God. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Again, the power is in you. Every spirit that operates in this world is, you know, we just came out of 
out of October and people get hung up on scary movies and watching a lot of this stuff and they get a thrill out of being scared. We have nothing to fear in this life. The Bible talks about not fearing death. Don't fear it because if you have the power of God inside of you, you have everything and more than what is necessary to address things going on around you. Point E, if we overcome, we will inherit all things. Revelation 21, 7, he who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So there are some promises in Revelation that are mentioned to those who overcome. Look at somebody next to you and say, you're an overcomer. You are an overcomer. You say, well, I don't feel like an overcomer. Well, feelings lie. They deceive. You are an overcomer, and God has made some glorious promises to overcomers. So here are seven promises for each one of us. You need to circle these, underline them, highlight them, fold this paper up, stick it in your Bible, carry it with you. And you'll notice that every one of these are tied to churches in Revelation that the Lord says, I have something against you. I have something against you. But then he offers them the answer, and he offers them this promise. To Ephesus, he said, you'll eat of the tree of life. Revelation 2 and 7, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So the tree of life, remember what we're pursuing. We're pursuing eternal life. And if we overcome, we will eat of the tree of life. We'll have that experience of eternity with him. Amen. Point B, Smyrna. Smyrna was promised that to overcome, they would not be hurt by the second death. Revelation 2 and 11, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. We often fear the first death. That's death of this body. That's not the one to fear. The fear should be on the second death. But for the overcomer, the overcomer shall not be hurt, not be touched by the second death. Point C, Pergamus. Uh, this promise was given to Pergamos, that they would eat of the hidden manna, and they would be given white stone. Revelation 2.17, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. What is that? That's the things of heaven. That's the things that we don't fully understand or comprehend yet. Hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone on the stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. And if you study, do any study in Scripture about name changes, names changed were significant in Scripture. You have Abram becoming Abraham, Sarai becoming Sarah, and every one of them represented something, a dimension that God was doing in that person's life. Every one of us, we're going to receive the promise as overcomers of a new name. What does that mean? Well, your name identifies you, right? It's an identity thing. Your identity will be different. So it doesn't matter what, you know, what sin or thing that you feel so guilty or so much shame about in this life right now. You put your faith in Jesus Christ. You trust him. Become an overcomer. As an overcomer, then you receive a new identity. That new identity is based solely in Jesus Christ, not in the things in this life. Amen. That's a wonderful promise. I'm, I can't wait for that. So then the next one, point D, Thyatira, have power over the nations. They'll have power over the nations. Revelation 2, 26, he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him, I will give power over the nations. We're going to rule with him. Amen. Praise God. And we'll rule perfectly. Won't be like, you know, we won't be tyrants in heaven. Although some of us may have thoughts of, you know, whenever I get to heaven and I'm ruling, I'm going to make that boss pay. No, I'm kidding. 
<clears throat> Sardis, Sardis says we'll be clothed in white raiment. Revelation 3 and 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. City of Philadelphia, or the Church of Philadelphia, be a pillar in, God, in the temple of God. Revelation 3 and 12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Laodicea, the church of Laodicea, would sit with Christ in his throne. Revelation 3.21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So these are some wonderful promises that if we just keep pressing forward, we keep pursuing God. Whenever we fall and we falter, we turn to God in grace and we come and we repent of our sin and we go out determined we will not return to that sin. And we go and we stand before God authentically, openly, we present ourselves to him. And if we keep doing that, if we keep living in the grace of God and pursuing God, then God has some great promises for us as we overcome. God does not take us out of this world to protect us the moment that we're born again. I wish I could tell you that the day I was born again, I never had any more problems. That's not true. Because you can get, you can come in, you can be born again, baptized in the water, have all your sins washed away in the name of Jesus Christ. You can come right over here, we can lay hands on you, be filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you could go home right to an argument with somebody significant in your life and want to cuss them out because they get you so stirred up, you're mad. I'm just telling you the truth. God does not take us out of this world or the pressure, pressures of this world. He does not protect us from everything that the world's going to throw us at all the time. Now, he will give us grace to endure. That's what Scripture says. My grace is sufficient for you. You will experience heartbreak. You will experience loss. You will experience pain. You will experience grief. You will experience things in life that come at you. But he has said, I will make you more than conquerors, more than overcomers. And if you just keep your trust in him, you'll get every one of these promises. His words are yes and amen. Only the rapture is going to take us out and will solve the problem of getting us out of this worldly environment. But until then, guess what? We have to live, we have to work, we have to attend school, we have to be neighbors, we have to walk among peers in society that may not live as we live, they may not repre represent God at all, they may not even recognize God at all. The Bible talks about wheat and tares growing up together, sheep and goats pasturing together. It says that two will grind at the meal, that means work, they'll be working together. And everyone says one will be taken, one will be left. So not everyone is going to go. And as long as that is the reality of our world, and it will be the reality of our world, until the Lord comes back, that side by side we will walk until God separates us, there will always be the issue of dealing with the spirits in the world. Because we're dealing with sin. And so while we await his return, what do we do? <clears throat> we must come out, be separate. We must be holy. We must be a distinguishable people, remaining unspotted by the world. Now, does that mean we'll be perfect? No, not at all. But it does mean that we have this pursuit in our life that, Lord, I don't care what it costs me. I just want to be marked by you. I don't care what I have to give up where I have to quit going, who I have to quit surrounding myself with. I just want to be marked by you. Most important relationship in my life is my relationship with God. And Scripture, 1 Corinthians 7.31, tells us while using this world, 
may we never abuse it. We should not abuse it. We should not misuse it. That includes the world. That includes the people around us in the world. Those who use this world are not misusing it, as not misusing it, for the form of this world is passing away. So we're here. We have to represent Christ while we're here. And then God's promises are to the overcomers, not to the conformers. Lord, help us not to conform to this world, but be transformed. Romans 12, 1 through 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'm going to tell you what our age needs. Our age needs a witness. Our age needs a witness. I don't know if you know, but there's an election that's going on in the world, in our world at least. Have you noticed that? Have you seen the ads? I saw a billboard yesterday. Anyway. When you think about politics, what do you think of? I know what I think of. I think of contention. People arguing their perspective and their point over everything. And I understand that. People are passionate about their positions. If you have not voted, you need to go vote. I shouldn't even have to tell you that as a, as a pastor and a preacher, as a man of God. You need to represent Christ in your voting. Go vote. Exercise your right given by our government, I guess. I don't know. It's a right given by God. You need to go vote. But what I'm about to say, this age needs Christians who will represent Christ's position regardless of what's going on in politics. No politician represents me because I'm trying to represent Christ. At the same time, I need to deal with the things of politics or anything else being Christ-like. I disagree with a lot of positions people take, but I'm not going to hammer them. I'm not going to be mean to them. And I'm saying that I've not, thank God, I've not seen anyone in our church post some ridiculous thing on social media, and then I had to call you and say, take that down. That, repre- that doesn't represent Christ. That represents your flesh. Thank God for that. So, I'm, I, listen, I'm not getting on to anyone. I'm just using this as an example. Our age needs a witness, whether it's in politics, whether it's in uh, social work, whether it's in going to your job and representing Christ at work, whether it's at your school. Our world needs a witness, and we are called to be light of the world. We are called to be salt. We're called to make a change. We're called to represent Christ. Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Everyone that comes in contact with you after some period of time should say there's something different about you. There's something different about you. They should find out pretty quickly, you know what, I am a Christian. You know what, I am someone, I am a zealot for the Lord. You know what zealot means? It means to be full of zeal. I have a lot of zeal and passion for the things of God. And I'm going to talk to them about it. I'm going to talk to them about it. I'm going to end quickly. If you'll stand with me. You know, I, I work with a few different people, and they uh, everyone has their own thoughts about God and everything else. Some, some think there is no God. Um, but even whenever they tell me, hey, this is happening in my life, I don't say, I hope that changes, or I hope, even trying to be respectful of their position of not believing in God, I say, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray, because I believe there is a God. And most of the time now, they say, thank you. They don't push back too much. But I do it with a smile, and I do it with love. I'm using that as an example. We are to be light, shining before men. And our life represents that with Christ. So we have to be called out from among them, but we're not separate from them. We represent Christ before them. Amen? Amen.
And I pray that the Lord helps us, helps us to be that. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for your spirit that is here this morning. God, I thank you for your words, Lord, that bring life. They direct our path, Lord. Help us, God, to put a heart underneath you, Lord. Lift you up as our king. God, to live in a pleasing life in this world, to deal with the enemy that's before us, Lord. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. It's not the people around us, but it is the spirit that is in the world, the sin that is before us, God, the things that come out of humanity. And we're all sinners. None of us are better than any others. But God, we've been separated from that, Lord. Help us to be the overcomer and to direct people toward the one that can help them to overcome. And we give you all glory and honor for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody say, in Jesus' name, amen. Take a moment, greet somebody, welcome them to Branches Church. Let them know you're so 